I'm Tim Tyler, and this is a video which responds to one of Steven Pinker's criticisms of memetics, the one where he asks whether culture's Lamarckian component makes explanations of culture that invoke natural selection redundant. In my book on memetics, which is out now, I take a look at some of the critics and criticisms of memetics. Steven Pinker is one of the critics, and Pinker expressed a number of objections to memetics in a 2009 Harvard lecture. Here, we will look at his notion that the Lamarckian principle of felt need makes redundant those explanations of cultural evolution which invoke natural selection. Here's Stephen. The idea is that even with that blind, non-teleological, non-intelligent process, when you have replication uh, and many generations of selection, the output of that process is something that looks as if it had been designed, but in fact is not. And that is the power of Darwin's idea. And I think to appreciate it, one has to compare it to its uh, chief competitor, which is Lamarck's first principle. Now, everyone knows his second and third principle. The second principle is use and disuse. The third principle is inheritance of acquired characteristics. But Lamarck started off with the principle of felt need. That's the idea that when the giraffe is looking up at those leaves that it can't reach, its neck somehow stretches to allow it to reach those, uh, those leaves. Or more generally, uh, you keep the, 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 your cat, the bird keeps slipping out of your grip, and so claws grow to allow you to uh, be more successful the next time. Now, of course, there's a, a good reason that the principle of felt need is obsolete. One of them it is, is that it is utterly mysterious. It's a form of magic that you could uh, just happen to grow the structure that would be useful in the environment that you find itself given the survival needs facing you. Also, if there really were a principle of felt need, it would make Lamarck's other two principles uh, unnecessary. In fact, it would make natural selection unnecessary. You wouldn't need any mechanism to ac account for evolution if you could just grow what you need when you needed it. Uh, so if mutation were directed, were foresightful, uh, responded to felt need, we would not need natural selection. And that's one of the reasons why directed mutation is such a, uh, an attractive op option to today's creationists. Uh, that is the loophole through which they want to get God <coughs> to function. But if you make that concession, then you have really sacrificed what is so powerful and uh, awe-inspiring about the theory of natural selection. The principle of felt need works a bit better in the cultural realm than it does in the organic realm. Cats can't grow claws in response to their desire to hang on to birds, but a human who wants to hang on to something can often get hold of a pair of pliers. Lamarck's idea was essentially that organisms respond creatively to help them meet their needs. Many organisms do, in fact, adapt in their own lifetimes to help them meet their needs. Plant roots grow around rocks. Trees find the hole in the canopy where the light gets in. However, this adapting often features only limited creativity. There are usually constraints on how far it can go. However, in the case of large-brained organisms, some fairly creative solutions are often possible. So, if you are smart and you feel the need for some innovation or another, then you can often respond creatively and make something that satisfies that need. So, the principle of felt need actually works after a fashion if you have a sufficiently big brain. Notice, though, that how well it works depends on how smart you are. Having a big brain helps, but it doesn't solve every problem, so there are still some limits. Creativity doesn't eliminate the need for selection, rather it partially internalises selective processes. An intelligent creature can perform trials inside their head, seeing what works and what doesn't work in a mental simulation of the external world. Such simulations reduce the need for expensive real-world trials. However, this doesn't really eliminate any selective processes, it just moves some of them from the real world into a simulated mental world inside the organism's mind. Also, mental simulations are usually imperfect, so real-world testing is also needed to see if what works in the mental world actually works in real life. So, in reality, there is plenty of cultural competition. Culture is not solely intelligently designed. Companies compete to sell products. Charities compete for donations. Authors compete for readers. Musicians compete for listeners, and so on. To deal with cultural competition and failure, 
Rather obviously, you need a theory that handles both mutation and selection, and evolutionary theory is the main theoretical framework for doing that with. So, we need forms of cultural evolution and cultural genetics. Directed mutations are a bit of a novelty for evolutionary theory, but it does already handle a wide range of different types of variation, bit flips, inversions, duplications, deletions, and a wide range of types of ploidy change and symbiogenesis. Intelligently designed variation is just another mutation module to add to a long existing list of such modules, and it fits right in, thus allowing modelling of both genetic engineering and memetic engineering without any particular problems. It may not make Pinker terribly happy to imagine creationists doing a jig at the thought of intelligent design being installed in the heart of evolutionary theory as a mechanism of mutation. However, that is pretty much what modelling cultural evolution demands. There's no getting around the fact that some variation is produced by large brain organisms thinking the variants up. So, as long as you remember to only invoke intelligent design after some intelligent designers have evolved, it really shouldn't cause any problems. Inevitably, some of those fighting the creationists will probably choke and splutter at the introduction of intelligent design into evolutionary theory, but they'll just have to get a grip. Intelligently designed variations are not a form of magic. Although we can't fully do so today, some, at some stage it will be possible to unpack the intelligent cultural variations that arise inside brains and give an explanation for them in terms of the interaction of a large number of unintelligent components. Enjoy.